Go ahead and have a seat if you do that. Welcome everyone. So glad that you are here joining us on this very special welcome weekend. We have many guests and visitors. We welcome you. So glad that you could join with us this evening. I'd like you to take your Bibles, if you would please, and open uh, today to the book of Matthew. We'll be in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 29. And the title of our message, The Soul That's Right with God. Let's open our hearts to receive from God's word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for meeting us here. We know that God, you pour out your heart to us through your word, and so we open our heart to receive it. God, we are so thankful that you love us so much, that you desire relationship with us, and that you pursue us in that love. So we Open our heart to you tonight, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I was thinking of when the disciples came to the Lord one day, and uh, they asked a very important question that was on their heart. And I think it's a question that is on a lot of people's hearts today. And what they asked was, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? You look around what's happening in the world right now, I think people want to know the very same thing. Look at what's happening in the world. It does not take tremendous spiritual discernment to understand that there have been storm clouds that have been arising on the horizon that are getting greater and greater and greater. There is something that's happening in the world. Anybody agree with me? Something is happening in the world. Right When you see the events unfolding in the Middle East, I'm sure that you're all paying very close attention to what's happening now, right? The war with Israel and Hamas. It reminds us that Israel will be the epicenter of the unfolding of prophetic events, just as the Bible said. Then you see Russia, China, Iran, all forming a new alliance that would be unheard of even 20 years ago, we understand that there is a new world order forming before our eyes, and there are spiritual forces of darkness on the move. There is something that's happening in the world. There's economic turmoil. There's record inflation. We've just come through a worldwide pandemic. Do all of these have significance? To that question, when will these things be? What will be the sign of the end of the age? Well, that's what the disciples ask. That's what we want to understand. And as you look at the verses that we're going to look at today here in the book of Matthew, we see that Jesus expects us to be spiritually discerning. Watch and see what is happening in the world. Uh, he wants us to uh, watch for the signs of the times. It's times like these. What's happening in the world today, man, it just, it stirs up your heart. It stirs up your attention. You come to understand that there's an urgency in getting right with God, right? Jesus answered that question uh, of the disciples by giving the signs of the time so that when you see those events, those signs that you would know that the end is drawing near. So Jesus said, and this is earlier in chapter 24, we're not gonna read the whole of it, but he said earlier that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, nation will rise against nation, kingdom will rise against kingdom, uh, there will be earthquakes that will grow greater in intensity and closer together as the uh, days draw nearer, uh, there will be a great falling away or an apostasy as unrighteousness and worldliness increases, uh, most people's love will grow cold. And it's interesting, he said that uh, in various places there would be plagues and famines. Well, he says these are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. The world will be in turmoil in the latter days. Now, it's interesting that Jesus mentions plagues and famines as signs of the latter days, especially since we've just 
come through a pandemic fairly recently ourselves. You know, there have been uh, outbreaks of viruses in the past, of course. You know, there was the so-called Spanish flu of 1918. There was the bubonic plague well before that, of course. But there is a growing intensity uh, as we see more and more of those outbreaks, right? There was the bird flu and Ebola and the Zika flu virus and SARS and MERS and, and on and on, right? The turbulence that's happening in the world today is setting the stage for the latter days. There are many who sense that there are spiritual forces that are moving, dark spiritual forces that are moving in the events that are happening in the world. Anybody agree with me? There is something that's happening in the world. It's times like these that wake you up. It wakes you up to the spiritual reality of your soul. In other words, it's time to get right with God. And you are going to have an opportunity to get right with God today. It's like God is saying, let's settle this matter of your soul. I love you, God is saying. That is the theme of the gospel. God loves you and wants you to have eternal life and life to the full. Now, Jesus said also, and we're going to see this, that there would be a great tribulation in those latter days, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world and will never occur again. That this great tribulation or the day of trouble uh, is called the day of the Lord and it will be the wrath of God poured out on the earth. So terrible will be that time of tribulation. It says that unless those days had been cut short, no life would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, for Israel, those days will be cut short. Now you might hear all of that and you might say, oh, how encouraging, Pastor, you are. I'm so glad I invited my friends. Well, it's times like these that we are stirred up. It's actually an opportunity. It's an opportunity for people to have their souls right with God. And you're going to have that opportunity today. Let's read it. We're in Matthew 24. And we'll just start in verse 29. Picking it up right in the kind of the middle of that message. I summarized already the opening of verses. But starting in verse 29, Jesus continues. And he says, immediately. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, <clears throat> the sun will be dark and the moon will give its light, will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all of the tribes on the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the latter days on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Then he says, now learn the parable of the fig tree. So after giving all of these conditions of things, the turbulence and the turmoil and all of that will be part of the latter days, he says, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that's a sign that summer is drawing near. In the same way, even so you, when you see these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. Here's what he means. For in those days, which were before the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, they were going about their lives, you know, eating and drinking and partying and going about their lives until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there shall be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. 
Therefore, you being on the alert, watch, for you do not know the day the, your Lord is coming. But be sure of this. If the head of the house had known at what time the, uh, uh, of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. So for this reason, you too be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think that he will. All right, these are the verses that we want to look at and understand because they are so relevant for us today when we see the things that are happening in the world. I believe that the message for us is very much the same. Be spiritually alert, right? Be spiritually alert. Notice what Jesus said in verse 32. Learn the parable from the fig tree. When the branch is tender, it put forth its leaf. That's a sign to watch. You know then it means that summer is near. Therefore, when you recognize these things, you will know that he's right at the door. So watch for those signs. Jesus gives the signs so that we can be spiritually awakened. See, that's why he does it. He does not speak of all of these things to disturb or agitate or bring stress on our lives. That's not why he's giving us the, these uh, things. He's not trying to bring stress. We already have a lot of stress in our lives. Isn't that true? We already have stress, which reminds me of a story. Do we have time for a funny story? Sure we do. So there was a husband who was overcome with stress. So he went to see the doctor, he and his wife. And uh, so after a thorough examination, uh, he uh, went out to the waiting area and he said to his wife, um, could I speak to you alone for a few moments? And so she said, well, of course, doctor. And uh, so he went to uh, you know, speak to her alone. And, and he said, now, your husband uh, has hypertension. Now, this is very, very serious. He could die. The stress, he just cannot have any stress in his life at all. This is very, very serious. I mean, he can die. So you need to bring all of his stress down. So uh, just do everything he wants. Uh, bring him uh, his slippers in the morning. Uh, make his favorite breakfast, his favorite meals. Uh, just uh, it, pamper him in every possible way. Uh, just be intimate with him as much as he wants. Just be as absolutely uh, uh, stress, no stress. Do everything he wants. Now, this is very serious. He could die. Do I make, is this clear? She says, I understand, doctor. Thank you. And so the husband and the wife, they get in the car afterwards. And the husband says, what is it? Why, why did he want to speak to you alone? What did he say? And she said, uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how to tell you this, but he said you're going to die. <laughs> we already have enough stress. No, he's not giving us these things to agitate. No, he's giving us things to awaken the soul. He's telling us these things that we would be spiritually alert, awakened. Like times like these ought to awaken the soul. When you're spiritually alert and your soul is right with God, no fear is abated. Notice 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. We love because he first loved us. God is love. That is the message of the gospel. Do not be afraid. In this world, there are many troubles, but I have overcome the world. God is with you. Uh, there's Matthew 24, verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not frightened. These things must take place, but this is not yet the end. Do not be frightened. He's giving us these things to be spiritually awakened. It's time for revival. It's time to get right with God. Because we know how this story ends. That's one of the great, wonderful parts of understanding the scriptures. We know that the story ends gloriously. And we know that our king reigns over all the earth. And he will come and he will set all things right. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise for that, right? We know. <clears throat> 
See, in verse 30, it says, the Son of Man will come at the end of the age with power, with great glory. Uh, the return of Christ will be the most spectacular event the world has ever known. You know, uh, back when newspapers were a thing, they used to have, uh, the news publishers would use different size letters on the front page according to the significance of the event, right? So the, 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 the bigger the event, the larger the font type, right? Well, the largest of all uh, uh, fonts was saved for the greatest event. It's called the second coming event. When that comes, we're going to put it in bold letters, it's interesting, by the way, how the world uses spiritual phrases to describe various events. For example, uh, when California shut down 10 miles of the I-405 freeway, they called it Carmageddon. When someone has a career-changing uh, career meeting, it's called a come-to-Jesus meeting. Let's have a come-to-Jesus meeting, your boss says, and you know you're in trouble. But the point of these verses is that the time to come to Jesus is right now because the signs of the times are all around us. It's time for a come to Jesus meeting, but a real one. Amen. It's times like these that we recognize it's time for a come to Jesus meeting. That's why Jesus says, when you see these things, recognize that he's near, right at the door. Consider the events that have happened in the last century. Uh, in World War I, 16 million people died. They thought that was the war to end all wars. But then World War II came. More than 16 million people died. Now, today, there are more than 25,000 nuclear uh, weapons in the world. At the peak, there were more than 85,000 nuclear weapons. And now Russia, of course, is uh, rattling the saber of nuclear weapons again. And now there, of course, is talk uh, uh, about the destructive capability of artificial intelligence. Oh, what times we are living in. But it's interesting because at the end of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur gave a speech uh, at the Japanese surrender ceremony aboard the USS Missouri. And I want to just read to you from some of that because it is very relevant to where we are today. This is what, again, General Douglas MacArthur uh, at, at the culmination of World War II. A new era is upon us. Even the lesson of victory itself brings with it profound concern both for our future security and the survival of civilization, the destructiveness of the war potential through progressive advances in scientific discovery has in now, in fact, reached a point which revises the traditional concept of war. Men from the beginning of time have sought peace, military alliances, balances of power, leagues of nations, all have failed leaving the only path to be by way of crucible of war. We have had our last chance, MacArthur said, if we do not now devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door. And then he says, the problem basically is theological and it involves the necessity of spiritual revival an improvement of human character that would synchronize with our almost matchless advances in science and art and literature and all material and cultural development of the past 2,000 years. If we are to save the flesh, it must be of the spirit. How profound words that alert us to the necessity of our souls getting right with God and then we see in what the words of the Lord gave to us that when he comes, he will come to set the world right. Oh, this is a messed up world. We can all sense it. Amen. It's a messed up world. But when the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lord comes, he will come to set the world right. You know, when Jesus returns, Scripture says he's pictured as riding on a white horse uh, and, and will be called faithful and true. 
Well, when you look around and you see the rising of everything that's wrong, everything that's based on lies and deception, isn't, it, isn't there something arising in you that longs for he who is faithful and true? Oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We need truth to reign in this world. We need the King of kings and the Lord of lords to come and to set this world right. Amen. Yeah, let's give a little praise, right? <clears throat> Some have wondered, why does he take so long? Why does he delay? Why does he wait? The answer is found in the patience of God. Second Peter chapter 3 speaks to it, uh, verses 7 to 9. He said, by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment, destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Not wishing, this is so key, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That is the heart of the Lord. You want to know the heart of the Lord? It's right there. The patience of the Lord. God wants no one to perish, but for all to come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. And then we see this in the word of God. Be spiritually ready. Yes, be Alert and be ready. The end of the age, he says, will come at a time when the world does not expect it. That's what he means when he says that the coming of the Son of Man will be like in the days of Noah. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage. That's when they would have their big feasts and marriages. In other words, they were going about their lives, they were eating, they were drinking, they were partying, totally oblivious to the danger all around them. But then he said in verses 42 and 44, we read it, Therefore, be on the alert. You do not know the day that your Lord is coming. So for this reason, you be ready. The Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. It's a word to stir us up. It's time for revival, it's time for the soul to be right with God. It's time for a come to Jesus meeting. That's why he's saying, be on the alert. Be ready by being on the alert, by being spiritually discerning. Look around, see what's happening in the world. Watch, be right with God. Let your soul be right with God. Be spiritually discerning. Understand the signs of the times, the <clears throat> condition of things on the earth as the latter days draw near. You know, here's a description of the latter, uh, of the condition of things in the latter days. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. He writes this, realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. It will come to a whole... Kids have always been disobedient. I've raised five. I understand. But it will come to a whole new level. Do you, do you agree with me that there is something happening in that regard? That's very concerning. Men will be ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless conceders, or conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does that describe the days in which we are living or what? Jesus rebuked, you know, the Jewish leaders for they had seen the signs right before their eyes, but they refused to believe. They would not believe, though the signs were right before their eyes. Jesus said this, Matthew 16, verse 3, you know how to discern the appearance of the sky? 
In other words, you know what he's saying there, right? When you see red at night, the sunset means red at night, sailors delight. Red in morning, sailors take warning. You can read the sky and know what it means for the weather. He said, you can read the skies. Uh, the, uh, uh, you can discern the appearance of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. He's rebuking them for they refuse to believe. The signs of the times were right before their eyes. I submit to you that we are living in days where the signs of the times are right before our eyes. And he's showing us these things so that we will believe. It's time to get right with God. It's time for a come to Jesus meeting. Because your soul is the most important of all. The most, the most important aspect of who you are is your soul. What is it you value most in life? What is it that you value most? In the Gospel of Matthew, there's the story of a young man uh, who seemingly had it all. He's described as a rich, young ruler. In other words, he's young, he's wealthy, he's powerful. These are things the world greatly desires, but he lacks something. He had all of these things, but he wasn't right with God. He lacked eternal life. His soul wasn't right within him. Teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? See, and if he didn't have eternal life, then he couldn't be satisfied in the world either. His soul wasn't right and he knew it. The world and all that it offers is not enough to satisfy the desire of the soul. There is a longing in the human soul. There's a searching, a longing for something. Something deeper. Something more glorious. Now, don't get me wrong. The world has many things that are certainly pleasant. I understand that. Don't get me wrong. It's true. The world has pleasant things. Uh, you can have things today that were once unimaginable. Uh, for example, Samsung just came out with a large screen TV they call The Wall. <laughs> 146 inches. The problem with it is that you have to sit in your neighbor's living room across the street to see it. But hey, you bring some microwave popcorn and some nachos and some Doritos and watch the game from there. Hey, there are pleasant things in the world. Don't get me wrong. I agree. There are pleasant things. But they're not enough for the soul. They're not enough for the soul who longs for glory, for more. Sometimes people come to a point in their life where they look around and they say, Is this it? Is this it? Is this it? Is this all? Is this all there is? I'm glad you asked. No, this is not all. There is so much more. When your soul is alive, you are truly alive. But if your soul is dead, you're dead. See, only God can satisfy the desire for glory for more, for something deeper, for meaning, for purpose, for significance. Only God can do that. Only the glory of God in the soul can do that. Only life from God that truly ignites joy and peace and love in the soul will do that. It's only when you recognize our spiritual poverty, the impossibility of saving ourselves, that our souls can be right with God. You'll never regret, you'll never regret having a soul that's right with God. For God will do that which is beautiful in the soul. There's where life is found, meaning and purpose and significance. It's when the soul is alive, when God ignites the soul with glory. Let me give you an, an analogy. The famous rapper Eminem once rapped in one of his songs, I will not 
rap the song because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> But I want to quote from the song because there's a lesson. There's a lesson in it. Eminem. I want the money, the women, the fortune, the fame. If it means I end up burning in hell or scorched in the flames. If it means I'm stealing your checkbook and forging your name. It's a lifetime of bliss for eternal torture and pain. Well, there's a lie right there. There's a lie, and I'll tell you where the lie is in that. That's not a lifetime of bliss. A lifestyle like that is not bliss. That's a lifetime of a soul that's in agony and in darkness. And if your soul has ever been in agony and darkness, you know that it is an agonizing condition of the soul. Another more insightful poet and songwriter, John Newton, wrote this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. This is what you need to do. You need to make a decision. There comes a moment when you must say, Lord, I want more. I want more. My soul craves for more. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for all the things I've done that was looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for life only to find darkness. There must come a moment when you say, I want more. I want my soul alive. I want to be right with God. I'm ready for a come to Jesus meeting. I want my sin forgiven. I want to go to heaven. What do I need to do? Like that young man who asked the Lord, what do I need to do? Well, can I give you an answer? Number one, realize you're a sinner. In other words, just own it. I, I once spoke, I was invited to go to the inside of a penitentiary in Texas. And I spoke to, they have a program there of, of, of raising up inmates to become spiritual leaders. It's amazing. And I spoke to one of the inmates who told me that God had, God had completely transformed his life. He said, when I came here, I had blood on my hands, but I've been washed by the blood of Jesus who took it all away. Now there's a story. Maybe you are a sinner, but I have good news for you. He's a forgiver. He paid for that sin and he paid for it in full. When Jesus died on the cross, he took the penalty of your sin upon himself and he paid for it that day when he died on the cross. He paid for your sin and it is paid in full that now all you need do is ask and God will forgive that sin in full. There's nothing that you can do to pay for it yourself. It has been paid for you and paid for you in full. All you have to do is receive the gift. But it starts with realizing you're a sinner. Number two, recognize that God is pursuing relationship with you. God is the one pursuing. That's why he sent his son. He said to seek and to save that which was lost. God sent his son to call your name, to knock on the door of your heart, to draw you out of that life that you were living and to be reconciled to God. God is pursuing. God sent his son to go and to seek and to find sinners. Go find sinners and bring them home. 
Prodigals must come home. Wanderers must come home. Number three, repent. That means turn this thing around. Turn this thing around. No longer walking away from God. Turn this thing around. God is saying, you turn this around and start walking toward God and with God and you'll have a relationship with him. That's what it means to repent. It means to turn this thing around. And then lastly, receive Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life. No one can make that decision for you. You cannot rest on the faith of your parents or your spouse or anyone else. It's not knowing about God, it's relationship with God. Only God can satisfy the desire for more, the desire of the soul for meaning and purpose, and glory and life and joy and peace and love. Only God can satisfy that. It's time to get right with God. The time is now. Don't wait another moment. It's time to come to Jesus. We're going to pray in a moment, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to get right with God. And I'm going to invite you to make your stand with Jesus Christ. So let's bow our, our heads with everybody praying. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to this earth to die on the cross to rise again on the third day, to defeat death. And because of that, offering forgiveness to anyone who would believe. Lord, help those who do not know you to receive that forgiveness, we pray. And while all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed in prayer, how many of you would say today, I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. I want Jesus to come into my life. I want him to forgive my sin. I want to know with certainty that I'll go to heaven when I die. Pray for me. I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. I want my soul to be made right with God. I'm ready to come. I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. If that's your desire, if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, I want you to lift up your hand to him and I will pray for you. If you want Christ into your life, for newness of life, would you just raise your hand? I want to just pray for you right now. Be bold. I see you there. God bless you. Anyone else? If you would receive. I see you there in the back on the side there. Amen. There in the middle on the sides. I see you guys there. Both of you. Anyone else? Or maybe you're here today and you've come to realize that you've been, a, been wandering too far and that you need to rededicate your life, to recommit your life. You want to start over in the Lord and start fresh and new. Is that you? Would you raise your hand that I can pray with you as well? You want to rededicate your life? Would you raise your hand too? Amen. Anyone else? God bless you. I see you there and there and there and there and there in the middle, there in the side. There, anyone else? Oh, God bless you. That's wonderful and amazing. Praise God. While all heads are bowed, may I just say that everyone that Jesus calls, he calls openly, he calls publicly. Jesus says, if you will acknowledge me before people, I'll acknowledge you before the Father and the angels of heaven. I want you to make a public stand for Christ. So wherever you are, if you raised your hand, and even if you did not, if you want your sin forgiven, if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want to know that you're going to heaven when you die, or if you rededicated your life today, I'm going to ask that you would make a public stand for Jesus Christ. Hey. What I want you to do is to stand right where you are and get up out of your seat and make your way down to this platform and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. That you would just stand up right where you are and just come right down here to the platform. Just be bold in the Lord. It's time to be bold in the Lord. That you would just come right here. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to pray with you. If you raised your hand and maybe if you did not, you would take a public stand for the Lord. You come and I want to pray for you. There are many coming. Let's welcome them as they're coming. Anyone else? Amen. Amen. If you, brought, if you brought someone with you, if you brought someone with you, I want you to turn to that person and say, if you want to go, I'll go with you. If you want to go, I'll go with you. You come. We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. Anyone else? We'll wait for you. 
You want to rededicate your life? You want to make a decision? You want to get right with Jesus? Anyone else? God bless you. We'll wait for you. Anyone else? Oh, and there's more coming. Let's give it a little praise. Amen. Amen. We'll wait for you. Amen. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. This is a prayer where you are asking Jesus Christ to come into your life to be Savior and Lord. It's really a prayer that only you can pray. Simple, yet profound when you mean it. I want you to know that God hears your prayer. Because the scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's what you're going to do in this prayer. So this, let's all bow our heads together. You all out there, you just pray together with us. Let's agree together and say this together. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I've broken your commandments. I've fallen short of your standards. But you died on the cross. You shed your blood. You paid for every sin I committed. And you rose again from the dead. Come into my life. Jesus, be my Savior, be my Lord, be my God, be my friend. I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Thank you for loving me and calling me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. 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 So here's what I want you to do. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have you go all move down this way and go all the way around the back. And then well, Pastor Matthew is going to tell you a few things, give you a little gift. And so would you all go this way, go down, and then go right. And Pastor Matthew is back there waiting for you. Everybody just go this way and go right to Pastor Matthew. And we're all going to just sit down together. Let's all go this way together. Here we go. Everybody this way. Yep, let's go this way together, everyone. And then all the way to the back, Pastor Matthew is waiting for you there in the back, and he's going to give you a gift and pray with you. Everybody, let's just go all that way together. Let's all keep just celebrating in the Lord today. Amen. Angels of heaven are rejoicing right now. We ought to be rejoicing, right? Woo! Amen. 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 All the way, we're going to usher them back with, with, with praise. Come on now, we're going to worship the Lord. We're going to celebrate all of them as we're going back together.